today we're going to talk about uh, the basic uh, procedures that um, that are common across all different types of biometric authentication and also look more closely into the different types of biometric authentication that exists. Okay, first you need to understand the process of um, how biometric applications work. It's a multi-step step process. The first thing we have to do in order to uh, to actually create the information that will later be used for authentication is to do something, go through a process called enrollment. And the enrollment process um, is divided into three parts. The first thing is, is that the user, whoever that may be, provides biometric data to the, uh, the system. Now the, this biometric data may be a fingerprint, it may be a palm print, it could be uh, just looking at the hand geometry of one of the hands, it could be an iris scan, it could be a retinal scan, or voice recognition, or other types of um, biometric data. Then the biometric system translates this information in raw form into something called a template, which we'll talk a little bit later about on the next screen. And essentially what the template is, is a simplified, simplified representation of the raw data. And then finally, this template is then securely stored somewhere in the system for later use. Now the template is, is, fundamental, is a fundamental idea to the concept of biometrics. And essentially, a template is a small file that's derived from the distinctive features of a user's biometric data. Notice that, that term distinctive features because the, the features that we're using to enroll and to use for our biometric authentication have to be distinctive and otherwise there would be uh, no use in, in using um, it as um, biometric data for a system. We want it to be different from person to person of course. And a template is essentially, as I said, a simplified uh, representation of the raw data that's provided to the system. And the template is used to perform biometric matches, as we'll see shortly. The interesting thing is, is that templates are often, or, or actually always, actually, vendor specific. So if I create a fingerprint template for my right thumbprint for uh, vendor A and then one for vendor B and one for vendor C, those templates will not be the same because um, the vendors will use a different algorithm to extract those features and actually write it out to a very small template. Facts about templates. First is, is that most of them occupy less than 1K, 1024 bytes. And in fact, there are some that, that, that can represent a feature in less than nine bytes. And of course, templates, as I indicated before, their sizes differ from vendor to vendor, depending upon the type of algorithm that is used by the vendor. Um, another great thing is, is it's similar to um, a one-way cryptographic hash, you know, fingerprints, irises, face, any biometric um, data that is presented to the system can't be reconstructed from a template. You can't look at the template and say, well, I can reconstruct this person's face, what it looks like, or what their fingerprint looks like. It's just one way. And finally, a unique template is generated every time a user presents biometric data to the system. Now think about that for a second. Every time you put your, your right thumbprint down on a biometric system, it generates a template that's different from the previous one you used. Now, think about this for a second. It's almost like every time you went to a computer and typed in your password, it's going to be a little different from the previous password you used, but the system would realize that it's the same user. Well, that's where the beauty of biometrics comes in, is because there will never be a perfect match between the template that was created in enrollment and the template that is generated from the presentation of the biometric data for authentication. Instead, there are algorithms that are generated by the vendors that create an index of similarity between the enroll template and the template that's generated at the time for authentication. And this index of similarity, of course, will be higher for someone who's, um, who's actually the person who actually enrolled the template and then came back to be authenticated. 
whereas people with with uh, different finger anybody else who would uh, create a template would have a lower similarity of index or at least one would hope and the similarity of index then must meet a certain threshold in order for the person to be authenticated. In other words, if it doesn't meet a certain threshold, then the system denies that person uh, access to the system. Whoops. And this brings into the concept of something called scoring. The match decisions that are made by the system for authentication between two templates, that is the one that's being stored from enrollment and the one that's uh, that's created at the time of authentication is based on this score, this score of similarity. And the score is a correlation resulting from the match between the two templates. And biometric applications use proprietary algorithms to generate these scores. So some scores may range from minus one to one or from zero to one or from one to a hundred and so on, but it really doesn't matter as long as you're using, they're using the same algorithm within the system. Um, and some proprietary algorithms are better than others. That is, they have more, they generate less false positives and false negatives um, than other systems. And later on we'll talk about the concept of true positives and true negatives and false positives and false negatives. Hopefully you've heard those terms before though. So because it generates a score and templates will never match from time to time for the same user, biometric systems do not render an absolute match like, like they would if you're, you were typing in your password. Only the probability of a match. So how does authentication work? So uh, the first thing of course is that the person has to have a template enrolled and so say go through the enrollment process at a later oh and by the way one thing I need to mention is that sometimes it may take several times to enroll to get a very good and clean template so um, you don't just sit down the first time like you would at a fingerprint station if, if you ever had the police take your fingerprints which I have for for good reasons not bad is that they can just do it once and usually it's fine with enrollment it may take three four or even five times uh, depending on how good the person is helping you to create that template so getting back to authentication, first the user provides the biometric data, that is your fingerprint or your iris or whatever, to the system. And the biometric system reads in the raw data and then translates this raw data to a simplified template. Then the system begins comparing this template to all the stored templates. And that's not exactly right, that's for a specific type of system, but just bear with me and, and in a second I'll show you the different types of systems. So you've got your template from the user and then the system begins comparing that template to all the other stored templates. In this comparison process there's a score generated for each template in the database. And of course templates will usually not match exactly, uh, but what we're looking for is this index of sim this score that's as high as can be that would indicate a closeness between the enrolled template and the person uh, trying to authenticate. So if this score is above some threshold, then the user is authenticated and they're allowed access to the system. Okay, the process of enrollment uh, is a process of taking biometric data and converting it to a simplified form. As I indicated before, uh, you can take your um, retinal, uh, excuse me, your iris scanner or your fingerprint and you can actually uh, simplify that down to a smaller representation that's as small as 1K in size. Of course, then the subsequent authentication to gain access to the system is done through the template. And the user may be required to enroll several times to get a clean template. Um, in presentation, you need to know this term, is the process by which a user provides biometric data to the acquisition device. So presentation just means you're taking your thumb and you're putting it on the reader or you're taking your uh, eye and you're putting it up to a reader um, to gather that biometric data. So different types of enrollment and authentication, and this isn't necessarily enrollment, this is uh, identification, authentication, there we go. There's something called one-to-one -one systems, and these are. this is actually more like uh, what you would find uh, in a password system. Recall uh, from your previous class with me with a password is that we have a password file that contains a user ID and it contains a hash of your password. It never contains the raw password. 
And so when somebody logs in, they log in with their user ID and their password. That password they've logged in with is converted to a hash. The system goes out and takes, looks, uh, takes the user ID and compares it against the user IDs and the password file. When it finds that, it can then compare that the hash that's contained in the password file against the uh, hash of the password that was just put in. If they match, then the user is authenticated. So in one-to-one -one systems, this does require some form of identification because the process is going to occur s very similar to what we see in a uh, password protected system. So uh, the user uh, types in their identification and then the system acquires the bio data and it simplifies that to a template and then the system attempts to match the person's um, template with that of the template that was just generated. That is the enrolled template against the, the, the presented template. Um, so it's only comparing two templates, the one that was used during enrollment, which can is similar or analogous to what we'd find the hash in a password file, and the template that was just uh, created uh, from the bio data. And if they match, and by, and once again, I misuse that term, uh, Recall it's not an actual match. There's actually going to be a score generated, a score of similarity between the two templates. And if it's high enough, it, if it exceeds a certain threshold, then that person is authenticated. Now compare that against one-to-end systems. In this, there really is no form of identification. What's occurring here is both identification and authentication. And this is a lot more complex. Um, well, it's, 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 it's the same process. However, you can have a lot more comparisons going on. And in here, there's no identification presented to the system. Rather, the user just um, presents themselves to the system where the bio data is acquired and simplified to a template. And then the system attempts to match that template against all the other templates in the system. And so the highest scoring template um, that exceeds a certain threshold will be the person who's authenticated. And so as you can see here, there's a lot more um, there's there should be for each user in the system for each template there will be a score that's derived and so hopefully one score uh, only one and only one score will exceed that threshold if more than one score exceeds the threshold then there's going to be uh, potential problems with uh, false matches something we'll talk about later on okay security issues uh, privacy and security now we know that uh, password files, by password files I'm sure you realize, at least when we're talking about Linux and Unix that we're talking about shadow files, are always protected, they're only readable by root. And the reason is, is that we don't want anybody to have access to those hashes and try to do a brute force or a, um, any other type of uh, dictionary attack against the uh, hashed passwords. Well we have the same thing here, is that we don't want to allow anyone access to those templates for several reasons. One is, is privacy, is that a person's template is actually biological um, information, even though you can't work back from it, but it's still uh, personal information. And second, in terms of security, if somebody was able to go in and change the template in the system, um, and let's say erased one person's template and submit their own instead, then a non-authorized user would be able to gain access to the system just because of this exchange template. And so it's very important that the templates are, are guarded very carefully. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, several different types of um, biometric data. Uh, let's look at the one that's been around for a while, and that is the fingerprint. And of course, the fingerprint you can use you can in, use any fingerprint that you like. Um, Quite often it's a thumb or the index finger. And the strengths of the fingerprints is it's a proven technology that's capable of a, <clears throat> a high level of accuracy. Later on we'll see what that means. Notice that it's, it's not going to be an exact match, but it's, um, there are going to be problems with this as we'll see. You have a range of deployment environments because you can, you can have the acquisition device be very small. Recall in the last uh, I class I talked about the uh, fingerprint authentication that's provided on IBM ThinkPad. So that's something that's very small. It can fit anywhere. Uh, it doesn't take up a lot of room. And so it can be deployed in lots of different environments for authentication. 
Another is it's very ergonomic, it's very easy use device. Most people don't mind putting their fingerprints on an acquisition device. As we'll see later, there's, uh, there's other acquisition devices uh, for other types of biometric data that are quite intrusive and very difficult to use. Even though their level of accuracy may be higher, the level of intrusion is higher as well. Excuse me. And also, you're able to enroll multiple fingerprints if need be. So if you have one fingerprint, um, it has a high level of accuracy. Uh, if you use two or three or four or five and looked at the templates for those, then you would even have a higher level uh, of accuracy and hopefully fewer uh, false positives. A false positive would be um, letting somebody into the system when they shouldn't be let in. The weaknesses are the inability to enroll some users. Um, war veterans that come back that, that unfortunately may not have fingers. Uh, people who um, work outside often you know, get cuts and scrapes and things like that on their fingers. So if they were to go and try to, um, to authenticate into a system with a, um, with a uh, cut finger, even if it was healing, may not be able to get into the system. There's also a performance deterioration over time. Uh, as one gets older, uh, sometimes your your finger, you get little scars and things in, on your fingers. And of course, there's a need to deploy specialized devices. But you know what? That's really not a weakness because that's true for all of these different uh, types of biometric data. Uh, one of the things you need to understand is is that the the quality, the, the level of accuracy is is tightly uh, connected to the quality with which you get that fingerprint. That is, in, during enrollment, you need a very good um, fingerprint scan in order for your template to be very accurate, and that's why sometimes it takes four or five times to enroll in order to get a very good fingerprint. This is this is a, a fingerprint over here, and here's a computer-enhanced version of that fingerprint, and so you see that uh, a lot of the, um, what they call minutia, that is um, individual characteristics of the fingerprint are actually brought out by um, using special electronic algor uh, digital algorithms to actually enhance everything, all the minutia. Okay, can can uh, fingerprints be beat? Well, yes. There's been recently in the news several different stories about people being able to uh, beat uh, fingerprint scanners. For example, there was one in the news recently where two German hackers uh, developed a technique to defeat biometric fingerprint scanners that were used to authenticate electronic pay purchasing systems. Now you see, if somebody were able to do that, they would be able to get in and either purchase things that uh, they weren't have or shouldn't have had access to. So um, it, they originally they had one sort of fingerprint attack that kind of worked, and later on what they did was is that uh, they created a latex fingerprint patches that were designed to be used while under observation. So you probably, I think I've seen this in a movie where somewhere where somebody um, goes to, to authenticate their system and then they authenticate even though they're not the person that's supposed to be um, authenticating and then they take off these, these little latex um, fingertips. So uh, originally, the, the technique they originally used was uh, used graphite powder and adhesive tape to lift fingerprints off surfaces in full scanners into accepting them as genuine, and it actually worked. However, they came up with an even better method of doing this. What the new method was involved taking a digital picture of a fingerprint image produced by graphite powder and adhesive tape, just like in the first technique, uh, and then the image was actually enhanced with special graphic filters. And they found that they could fool the um, the authentication system. Uh, I think I believe it was 80% of the time. And there's a couple of other hacks. There was a Japanese cryptographer um, that also did the same thing. Um, and this guy used the gelatin like found in gummy bears um, and plastic mold to create a fake fingerprint, which he found full fingerprint detectors four times out of five. Now that's 80% of the time. So you take your fingerprint, um, you take somebody's finger and you, you rub the gelatin over it and then you put that again and uh, create a plastic mold out of that and that created your fake fingertip and that was able to to fool the systems. And then uh, he was actually able to improve on this 
um, by taking a latent fingerprint from a glass, latent just means hidden, which he then used, uh, he enhanced with a, an adhesive that's found in super glue fumes, and you've probably seen this in a lot of movies, including um, oh, the Eddie Murphy movie, I forgot the name of it. I think Beverly Hills Cop 3. Okay, so then he got the picture, then he used Photoshop, uh, he improved the contrast of the image, and printed the fingerprint onto a transparency sheet. Then he took a photosensitive printed circuit board and used the fingerprint transparency to etch the fingerprint into copper. <laughs> From this he made a gelatin finger using the print on the, uh, the board using the same process as before and once again it fooled him in 80% of the cases. So you can see, and this, by the way this would be something called a false positive, is that you're allowing somebody access to the system that shouldn't be. So as you can see that fingerprint systems are not foolproof. Other hacks, probably ones that you've seen in movies too, I can't remember where I saw this, but you, somebody cut off somebody's finger or they cut off a hand and, um, and then you present the cut off finger or hand to the system and voila, you're into the system. Now they've got systems that actually check the temperature of the finger to make sure that it's within the subject range of, uh, of normal human beings. So that's about all of our fingerprints. Okay, let's look at palm prints. This is also called um, palm prints. Uh, use some of the, some of the same sort of um, technology in comparisons that are found in fingerprints. Uh, they also do some. Um, there's also something called hand geometry that looks at the points between how the fingers and the hand actually lay out on the, um, the acquisition device. Uh, some of the strengths of this is it, you have the ability to operate in, in challenging environments. Uh, and that would also go, of course, you know, anything that goes for the fingerprint um, strengths would also probably go for the palm print. You'd have a they have an established, reliable core technology that's been used for a while, and uh, it's not very uh, intrusive. That is, people don't mind putting their hand down on an acquisition device uh, just as uh, as they wouldn't with the fingerprints. It's a relatively stable physiological characteristic as the basis. That is, your hands really don't change that much over time and so there's a combination of convenience and deterrence. The weaknesses are unfortunately it's inherited limited in accuracy and the form factor because you need a larger acquisition device limits the scope of potential applications and the price of a palm print recognition far outweighs that of something that you would find for a small fingerprint. So you have to weigh um, you have to weigh price against accuracy and in this case since it has inherited limited accuracy and the prices uh, sometimes prohibitive, then this is probably not a good use as an um, authentication tool. Okay, the face. Uh, face recognition has been around for a while, and you've probably seen that in movies as well. Uh, before I start talking about the strengths and weaknesses, let's see how this works. First thing, if we just go back, let me do this right here, this makes a lot more sense if we do this. What essentially you're looking at right here are something called the nodal points. And every, I don't want to say every face, but most people have, um, you know, a nose, you know, a chin, a mouth, and eyes, and so on. And each of these positions right here is called a nodal point, and they're really facial landmarks. And typically there are about 80 nodal points on a human face. So what the uh, acquisition device does is it takes uh, these, it takes these, um, these nodal points and get a distance between the different nodal points, for example the distance between the eyes, the width of the nose, the depth of the eye sockets, the cheekbones, the jawline, and the chin, and then creates a template from that. And then there's statistical uh, analysis program that's actually used to, to create a template from all this information. The strengths are is your ability to leverage existing equipment and image processing. This has been going on for a, t for a long time. Uh, computer scientists have been very interested in vision research and the ability to get a computer so it's easily able to recognize a face as easily as a human can do because we're very good at that. Um, another good uh, strength of this is the ability to operate without physical contact or user complicity. That is, the user doesn't actually have to uh, well, we'll see in a second how this works. That is, the user doesn't really have to enroll in the system in order for this to work. And the ability to enroll static images, and these two things go together as we'll see, because the police actually used this some time ago to identify people 
um, who had warrants out for them. Weaknesses, the acquisition environment effect on matching accuracy, that is, um, you, that is, you need the right amount of lighting and so on. Um, uh, also, changes in physiological characteristics may reduce the matching accuracy. So, for example, here, uh, there's some things that are not going to change. For example, the width of the person's mouth, the width of their nose, uh, the distance between the eyes. Some of those things don't change, but some may change. For example, if this person grew a really bushy beard right here, it may affect the accuracy of the measurement between um, both sides of the mouth. And also there's the potential for privacy abuse due to non-cooperative enrollment and identification and this is related to these two things up here as we'll see as we go right here. What are some of the uses? Well at Super Bowl 35 that was in January 2005 the police in Tampa Bay used this software called Faceit to search for potential criminals and terrorists in attendance at the event and it found 19 people with, with pending arrest warrants. Now if we go back here we see what they did was is, is they took their lineup photos or their booking photos rather and they enrolled them as static they enrolled the static images of the suspects into the database and then they were able to identify the people without any physical contact or user complicity